Hello and welcome to The Fix, a podcast about post-processing, Lightroom, Photoshop, plugins, essentially the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. I'm Sean Duggan, your host, and on today's show, my guest is Dan Hughes, a photographer and visiting associate professor at RIT. And Dan is going to talk to us about processing black and white images using the Tonality Pro plugin for Lightroom and Photoshop by MacFun Software. We also have the return of the Rocky Nook book giveaway, where you can win the Rocky Nook book of your choice. So stay tuned. It's going to be a great show. Well, thanks for tuning in and joining me as always. I do appreciate that. So before we get into uh, hanging out with Dan Hughes and talking about Mac Fun Tonality Pro, I do want to mention the return of the Rocky Nook book giveaway. It's been on hiatus for a couple of weeks as uh, I was off in Photoshop world doing some of those short audio interviews that we had for the past two episodes, but it is back today. And once again, the details of the Rocky Nook book giveaway are that one of you listeners or viewers will be able to win the Rocky Nook book of your choice. They have a lot of really interesting photography books. So you should head over to their website at rockynook.com to check out all of the cool titles that they have to offer. And then stay tuned towards the end of this episode, and I'll give you details of what you need to do to enter to win the Rocky Nook book of your choice. All right, without further ado, let's welcome Dan Hughes to the show. Dan, hey hello, how are you doing? Awesome. This is fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and so I just want to mention for the viewers that there, there may be a little bit of a lag. We're experiencing some, some satellite lag here because we are on two sides of the North American continent here. Dan is back east in Rochester. New York, and I'm out west in California. So, what have you been up to, Dan? What's what's uh, what's summer been like for you? Uh, well, I taught the first half of the summer. Uh, we had a, a photo one class for the first five weeks, which is basically 15 weeks of uh, you know photo one uh, cut into six weeks. So, um, we did that, and I've just been working on some personal projects recently, uh, messing with ex uh, well, kind of experimenting with gelatin. Um, and, and making print processes through gelatin. And so uh, can you elaborate on that by gelatin? Are you referring to a physical substance or is that the name of some new software that I'm not aware of? Oh, well, good question. Uh, so, so it's a process called carbon printing. It's an actual printing process um, where you, you take gelatin and you add pigment to it and then you add dichromate and you, you can take digital files print them onto a digital negative, and then uh, make carbon prints from them. It's just different than inkjet. looks different than a standard sort of silver print as well. Right, right. And so it's, it's, a, um, it's a contact printing process then where you're, you're having to size the negative to the size that you want your actual print to be. Yeah, precisely. And it's just a, you know, a nice challenging thing to try out, uh, switch up my, my printing process a little bit. Now that sounds that sounds really interesting. Actually, it sounds like something I'd be interested in doing. Uh, I've taken workshops before that have you know kind of delved into that, uh, both in the pre-digital uh, part of my photography experience and, and also later you know working with digital negatives. But it's not something I've I've yet kind of gotten rolling uh, on a regular basis with my own images. But I'm definitely you know drawn to processes like that that mix in the analog. Uh, quality in with the digital yeah just a, a different kind of craft you get your hands dirty a little bit too yeah yeah exactly and, and kind of harkening back to to the days of the dark room uh, uh, a little bit yeah precisely it's always fun to do that stuff and actually if you want to so, have a conversation about that at some point that's another fun one <laughs> Oh yeah, no, no, that that would be a great show because I, I like to mix in, you know, uh, some of the analog post processing uh, with the digital because the 
you know, kind of the whole philosophy of this show here is the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. So, you know, that definitely fits in there. And there are a lot of photographers who I think are, are interested in, in, you know, uh, utilizing some of the analog approaches, the old ways. Right. <laughs> So um, you mentioned earlier that you were teaching um, this summer, and uh, where was that that you were teaching those classes? Right, uh, it's a, the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, we've got a, a BFA a, uh, in photography, a Bachelor of Science in Photography, and MFA programs. Um, and I was teaching uh, a Bachelor of Fine Arts Photo One class, basically. Ah, oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, that's a, uh, a school with a, a long history in the photographic arts, uh, no doubt due to its, uh, its location in the, the ancestral home of Eastman Kodak. Right, right, right. And, and so in your personal work, you do a lot of black and white, is that correct? I, I do, yeah. I, I tend to gravitate a lot more towards black and white in my own imagery. Um, and, and I get into infrared black and white as well, which is another good time, but, uh, primarily been shooting, you know, visible spectrum, digital black and white work recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember when I was, um, back, back in the day when I was shooting film, um, I shot a lot of, uh, at, at that time it was infrared on black and white film, the Kodak high speed infrared and i actually have a few rolls still in my refrigerator that i think expired in 1995 so oh, wow. uh, one of these days i'm going to pull them out maybe do some tests and see if i can find a project to use them with because yeah. i don't let them go to waste right that's awesome too yeah i'm sure those are and, but you're shoot you're, you're shooting um you're shooting your infrared stuff uh digitally i'm assuming in a camera that's converted to shoot infrared Correct. Yeah, it's a D800 that uh, I had converted to, to shoot near-infrared and infrared. Wow, well, that's a nice big camera. You get a big file from that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Good yeah. and sharp. <laughs> Good sharp. Yeah, cool. So, listen, uh, you know, t tell us a little bit about um, uh, your background with... Um, uh, software development. I know you've done some work in the past with Nick Software. Right. So uh, I actually, I, after graduating from RIT's advertising program, um, you know, I got a job at Nick Software as the webinar trainer and basically taught three webinars a day, five days a week for several years um, and then moved on to Google to help them sort of transition software and uh, utilize the technology in, in their um, capacity. And then um, I went on to Mac Fun and we're going to have a conversation about tonality today. Um, but I helped develop tonality and I, I, I don't, I didn't do anything in terms of actually, you know, the ones and zeros in the development of the software. I worked with the CTO, um, to, to basically make sure all of the bells and whistles were working properly, uh, and to make sure that, you know, we had all the right sort of functionality within the software. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's an important role though, because that's kind of almost like the liaison between, the engineering developer side of, you know, creating a piece of software and then the, the end user experience of it, you know, you're kind of bridging that, but those two worlds to make sure that everything translates over seamlessly and smoothly and, and in a way that's easy for the user to understand. So, you know, that's an important role. Right. Right. I like to think so anyways. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. I've, you know, I, in terms of Mac fun tonality pro, I've always been impressed with it um in in terms of how it's laid out and the functionality that it that it offers and um the reason i was looking forward to having you on is that i know that you know a lot more about it than i do so i'm expecting to pick up uh, some some tips and tricks on how i can use the software better here today absolutely yeah we're going to talk about some some cool features that are within the software that um aren't covered most of the time in, in most trainings um and, and they're just features that I really like, really. Yeah. Well, great. Well, do you want to fire up your screen share? And we'll, we'll dive in and, and check that out. Yeah, absolutely. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So we've got Lightroom open here. Uh, we're going to be talking about tonality uh, from the Creative Kit, MacFun's uh, premier black and white software. 
Uh, but before we get into it, I just want to talk about why you might actually want to use a plugin as opposed to, um, you know, using your your raw processor or your your Lightroom or Adobe product or possibly uh, any other raw processing tool that you might be using for the black and white conversion. Um, and it's basically because of the feature set that's built into Tonality Pro. Uh, now, before you'd launch into Tonality or really any plugin for that matter, uh, I would recommend starting with a, a raw processor, right? And here within Lightroom, I'm going to switch over to my develop module. Uh, at the very least, you want to kind of massage the the white balance if it's necessary definitely change any lens corrections you might need to turn on uh the image here that i've got open i didn't have the lens corrections on the white balance looks pretty good um and also you know if you're somebody who who feels really comfortable doing processing um on your raw file within adobe camera Raw or within lightroom by all means you, you know use this as an opportunity to utilize all of the tones within the image, you know, you can create a look that you really like before you even open up into Tonality Pro. Um, for our demonstration purposes, the imagery that we're going to use is, is pretty much straight. I didn't do too much uh, to the original image, um, but, you know, again, by all means, definitely do that if, if you, you know, you like to utilize your blacks or your whites and your clarity tool, um, as well as and this is a really cool feature within Lightroom that's it's relatively new. It's not, it's not brand new, but the dehaze tool, which I'm sure we've covered on the fix uh, before, or it's been talked about, um, uh, you know, on numerous occasions uh, and other places as well. Really fantastic tool and does a good job for converting um, or helping change tones when converting from color to black and white. Um, let, me, uh, let me just... Yeah, let me let me dive in here really quick and, and just to ask a clarification question kind of in my role as uh, as the uh, proxy for the audience. Um, if you know that your your end result or your, your end creative goal is to have a black and white image, do you recommend at all first making any basic adjustments to the shot? in color before it gets into black and white for instance like making it look good as a color image before you even go to black and white or do you just kind of go straight to black and white and then do all your massaging there great question so um i personally utilize the you know the raw tools quite a bit and and you know sometimes i don't even make the color image look good i i will sort of tone the photograph um in a certain way that doesn't really look that good in color you know, but has the correct color balance and maybe has uh, all of the tones that I might want. You know, for example, here in this photo of, of my buddy John, um, in, in color, you know, these tones, they're really dark down here. And we're, we have a raw file. It's a, a NEF file. I definitely would want to bring out the shadows, you know, in the blacks a bit before converting this to black and white, um, especially when going into any sort of plugin. Uh, because, of course, when you're within the raw process, within Lightroom here in the develop module, you do have access to all of that information, all of that data in the raw form. When you go outside of Lightroom, so when we take an image you know, from Lightroom into Tonality, we're actually converting the file into a TIFF file. So um, if I'm gonna make any sort of dramatic changes to the highlights or to the shadows or adjust color, like in this case, I could probably make this a little bit more yellow. Um, I'm going to do that first in the raw process before going over into uh, Tonality Pro or any black and white conversion software for that matter. Right, right, right. Yeah, because the uh, when you are working with a raw file, taking it into uh, a plugin such as McFun Tonality Pro it, it is not that much different in a way from taking it into Photoshop. The raw file is being uh, processed and and kind of rasterized into a uh, uh, a TIFF file or a PSD file or whatever is, is the destination format for, for where you're going. Right. And, you know, we should mention that those files are still robust. They're still, you know, full of information and they're really great, but it's not the same as having that original raw data. Right, right. Well, cool. So let's go ahead and open up into Tonality Pro. Uh, I want to show you a couple really cool features. We're going to launch right now from Lightroom um, and then we're going to, you know, do our adjustments within Tonality Pro and we'll come back to Lightroom. Uh, to do that, I'm just going to right click on my image within the Lightroom develop module in this case. Um, and it, it, mine's funny, for some reason, my Lightroom, it shows up both in the edit in 
So I can go to edit in tonality app, or if I go to export, uh, because I've created sort of a user preset. So it, it will actually, or can be slightly different depending upon how you set up your Lightroom catalog. And to be honest with you, I did it so long ago, I don't know what the default setting is. Um, so it, it could show up one of those two places once you've installed it. Um, but we're going to launch into tonality. It's actually going to make a duplicate file for us. So we're never touching that raw file. It's being duplicated. Here we've got a 16-bit per channel TIFF file. And it actually tells you that here within the, the, um, uh, the interface, it turns upper right corner. And the reason why I would be concerned with that and the reason why I want to work in a 16-bit per channel sort of workspace here uh, is because when I'm converting from color to black and white, um, I, I kind of escape reality. You know, I do a, a, a lot of adjustments to the photograph. Um, you know, this is a very flat initial black and white conversion right now. Um, I want to create a lot of depth and a lot of form. And to do that, I've got to manipulate these pixels quite a bit. And so the fact that I've got a 16 bit per channel file is, is going to be advantageous. Right, right. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. All right, so we, we're in Tonality Pro. Again, I'm not going to cover sort of the more basic things, but uh, there's some really great interface tools for being able to navigate. I'll kind of go throughout those while, while we're uh, talking about the software itself. But uh, one of the key features that I really want to get into is all of the different layer styles that we have within Tonality Pro. Um, it's Layers, um, for, for some folks, are, they're a little bit intimidating. So hopefully we can kind of uh, describe what they are pretty well so that you can get a good sense of what they're doing. Um, but they're super important within our black and white conversion. Um, and just to show you a really quick example of that, uh, I'm going to move into my color filter tool. And the, these color filters, these buttons right here on the right side of the interface, um, they actually emulate what would happen if you shot a red filter or a blue filter, um, you know, over your lens when shooting film. And if I click on it, you'll see the, the tones change pretty dramatically. And actually, this is really quite nice. You can see exactly what's happening uh, because with, with software like this, we're taking the original color information and we're converting it to black and white. But while we do that, we're actually using all of the color information. So if I click on the red color filter, it does this to the image. If I click on the blue one, it does that, right? Which is very, very different. And you can actually see how those sliders shift around quite a bit. Right, uh, this, right, right. And, 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 this and is, let me, let me, go ahead. So, so excuse me, let me, we, we have that little uh, uh, latency lag between our, our coasts here, but let me just uh, clarify for people who've never ever shot that way. Uh, with you know a red filter or a yellow filter or an orange filter over their lens while they're using actual black and white film, what's happening there is like for instance with a red filter is that it is filtering out the um, the opposite wavelength. So blue, which is kind of opposite from from red, is is not being allowed. The, the blue spectrum of light is not being allowed to reach the film as much as the red and so anything that is blue in the image such as the sky in this scene renders as very very dark because not that much light has reached that part of the scene whereas things that are red in the image show up lighter such as the barn in this case right and, and this can be a really sort of powerful tool to use in post-processing you know with the the problem that you'd run into um when doing this with film or even kind of making these kinds of adjustments, if you could, in other ways with film, you know, limiting spectrum. Uh, once you do it, it, you're set in stone with the frame, right? So you can't do anything after the fact. Uh, and the beauty of doing this digitally is that I can go and I can click through each one of these because it's utilizing all that color information. Uh, well, what's so cool about pairing this color filter tool with layers within Tonality Pro is that I can actually use, let's say, the red layer or the red color filter rather on the top half of the image and then uh, a blue color filter on the bottom half of the image and I can mix those together utilizing these layers. So to do ah, that, very nice, very nice. I'm going to go ahead and just click on the blue color filter here. I'm going to move into the clarity and structure tools and I'm just going to bump these up a little bit so that we can get a little more sort of delineation of tones, uh, you know, within the foreground. But I'm starting to like the contrast in the foreground quite a lot not so much in the sky. I, I, don't, I, I want there to be a little bit more tone in the sky. Um, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to click the plus button in the upper right corner here in the layers section. And this is going to add a new layer. 
uh, to our stack of layers on the right side. And it's not going to change anything to the, in the photograph necessarily until we do something. Um, but what will happen if I go into this layer number one and I start making adjustments on a standard layer, it's going to affect everything all at once. Right? But what it's doing is it's taking the information from underneath, that is layer zero, and then it's allowing us to make some adjustments up here. And the benefit in this case is that I could go into my brush tool in the upper right corner or the gradient tool, and we could apply you know, this second layer separately. Uh, now, just to kind of reiterate the, the interesting aspect of, of having these layers and then being able to mask, and then utilizing color filters. So we're kind of getting all of these three functions uh, we're putting together. I'm going to hit the cancel button in the upper right corner. Um, I'm going to actually right click on my layer. And, and this shows up in two different places. Um, and this can be sort of a, a confusing aspect here. But if I right click uh, on the layer itself, I have a whole bunch of layer styles and layer features. You know, I can copy a mask so that I can paste it onto a different layer. I can duplicate a layer, I can copy settings and so on. Uh, the important one right now though, is the use original image uh, option. And what this is gonna do when I click on it is we're gonna actually gonna, we're gonna start over from scratch. It'll be sort of the, the original black and white conversion and we're gonna have access to that color information. In fact, let me, let me back up here. So I'm, we're gonna click on this in a minute. Right now, I'm not gonna click on it, it's the normal layer. Right, I'm going to double click on exposure. I'm going to move into my color filter. So on layer zero, we clicked on the blue color filter. On layer one, I'm going to click on the red color filter. So there's no change that occurs here, right? And so you'll say, what the heck? Why is there no change? Well, it's because it's utilizing the black and white information from layer zero, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't know that there's any color there. What we'll do though, is I'll right click on layer one. I've already clicked on uh, the red color filter there. I'm going to use the original image. And now what we're going to get is we, if we toggle layer one and layer two off, is basically layer zero has the blue filter, layer one has the red filter. And then what I can do is go in and just mask that red filter, right? So I can maybe set a gradient here with the gradient functionality. Um, go ahead and click the apply button. And then if I wanted on the mountain range, I could click on the brush tool in the upper right hand corner. And basically, okay, I'm going to grab my Wacom tablet and I'm going to paint it into the mountain. And you're not going to see so a dramatic me, change. Yeah, and let me just cl clarify for, for listeners who might be uh, experiencing this through the, the audio podcast that the what Dan is doing is it, it's sort of very similar to how you might apply some of the local adjustments in Lightroom, the interface is very, very similar. It looks very similar on screen when you're applying them like the gradient adjustment or using the brush to modify the gradient adjustment. So if, you, if you're familiar with the Lightroom interface already, the, uh, the interface of Mac, of Mac Fun Tonality Pro is going to look uh, familiar to you. Right. If you've used a brush tool before, or if you've used any sort of uh, uh, gradient tools, these are almost exactly the same. You know, the, it looks a little bit different and you do have, you know, your brush options with the size, the opacity and the softness. Um, but it, it will, it looks slightly different. Um, well, I guess it's similar to Lightroom in that you have a sort of a softness uh, brush around the actual brush, right? You can see how soft or hard the brush is. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's sort of in the same, uh, you know, obviously there are interface differences, but um if you're already familiar with the, the basic concepts of, of adding a gradient or a gradual filter mask in Lightroom, you know, this is a, kind of a similar operation. Right. Hey, hey Dan, before we uh, continue on, I just have a clarification question about the layers um, that people might have. And, and so my question is this, are these actual duplicate uh, versions of the image like you would have in Photoshop if you copied the background layer? Or is the layer just a set of instructions similar to an adjustment layer for how to interpret the image? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know the inner workings of how that layer structure works, but I, I do know that if you use the original image uh, option, it reacts more like it is a layer of pixels as if you duplicated the original background up, as opposed to if I don't have the use original image, it does feel as though or functions as though 
um, it's it's more of an adjustment layer. Now that said, I don't know the actual specifics of that one. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So. We're not going to come to a sort of a finished product on this photograph. I just thought it was a good example. So being able to see how these layers work and then sort of utilizing the, that cool trick of the color filters and combining those together. Um, I'm going to go ahead, though, and pretend as though this is the finished image. I'm going to click the apply button in the upper left corner just so you get a feeling for what happens um, when we jump back over into our piece of software, which in this case is Lightroom. Uh, what we should have is the original photograph and then right next to the original photograph, we'll have our black and white rendition, um, you know, saved copy. Uh, although I am sitting here in a collection, so I don't know what my collections feature um, is going to do here. So here I go and explain it like that, and then uh, it doesn't happen because I'm not in my, um, I'm not in my folder. I'm in a collection, and I've turned that off within that particular collection. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, I know what you mean. That's that's happened to me before. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't automatically it, it doesn't automatically inherit the collection status um that that the kind of parent image had right 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 so it should be right here although it's it's actually not doing that either so uh we'll see what happens from here on out <laughs> all right so again we'll jump into photoshop here um the the interface within tonality is going to look exactly the same once we've launched from photoshop uh to tonality uh, but one of the nice features that you do have within Photoshop is that you can then utilize the layers within Photoshop, you know, blending modes um, and any other tool that you like to utilize within Photoshop. So uh, my, my own personal workflow, I, I focus on using Lightroom as much as possible and then utilizing the plugins when necessary. Um, I don't usually open it into Photoshop unless I need to do uh, a pixel manipulation or compositing uh, for the most part. But I do know a lot of folks that, that do prefer to use Photoshop, so uh, we definitely want to launch from here. Uh, and this is the final image that we're going to create. Uh, here's the original photograph. Uh, it, was a, it was a raw photo shot with another D800. This one wasn't converted um, to, to infrared. And it's a you know, long exposure. I, I want to say it was 212 seconds or so. I uh, was out photographing the California coast with some friends a couple years ago and uh, created this you know, nice little serene, quiet moment um, in color. And in fact, before we even turn the image black and white or, or look at it from tonality, you know, I think it's important to talk about why one would do something instead of just saying, here's a set of tools, here's how to do it. Um, you know, black and white photography is, a, is an escape from reality, or at least it is for me. Um, and, and the beauty of shooting long exposure like this is that it is also an escape from reality. And so therefore, when we convert from color to black and white, uh, we have this really nice sort of ethereal kind of story that you're telling. Um, and I think that's yeah, what that's I'm so nice. interested in. Yeah, and, and it's a few adjustments within Tonality Pro, but it's a really wonderful transition from you know, the color rendition, which is a little bit blue because of the filter that I was using. Um, it, you know, it, it's this weird kind of real place, but in this unrealistic sort of capture. Um, and so by converting it to black and white, we can kind of use the essence of that, you know, lack of reality um, and, and really push it a lot further. So let's, let's take a look at how to do that. I'm just going to delete the tonality layer there. I'm actually going to copy my background layer. So in this case, I just use the shortcut command J. Uh, I like to rename that layer. Uh, so I'll just rename it tonality. And what we'll do is go up to the filter drop down menu, uh, down into uh, the MacFun software, and I'm going to hit tonality pro here. What will happen is the software is going to take that 16 bit per channel bit of information, port it over. Um, and then when we're done within Tonality Pro and we hit that apply button, it'll bring us back over into Photoshop and it'll apply all of the adjustments on the layer that we uh, opened Tonality Pro up on or with. All right. So back within Tonality Pro. And before we start editing the photograph, we are going to be getting into layers. We're going to talk about layer masks a lot more. Um, but before we do that, I, 
we kind of have to make the decisions as to what we want to do to the photograph. Uh, and a good way to do that in a good way to kind of get the potential of any kind of photo is actually utilizing presets. So there's all sorts mm. of presets yeah. within, you know, within almost any kind of software. Now they're, they're kind of a uh, commonplace that you have to have a, a lot of really nice presets. Um, in tonality, I, I think there's something like 150 different presets, uh, which is where, where you might get started. Uh, I u utilize these presets all of the time, but what I'll typically do is I'll utilize them selectively. So in this case, we're going to stick with the basic, um, the basic presets. Uh, we can actually just click through a couple of them. Uh, another really cool feature that's in internality, I almost totally forgot about this. I use it once in a while, um, is there's a slider on each one of the presets. And basically this allows you to control the opacity of that layer or what we'd say is the preset, right? You can control the strength of the preset. Uh, so this is, um, this is the slider that's peering just, just for to clarify for people who might be listening to the audio version. This is a slider that it appears on the thumbnail of the preset kind of down in the film strip view. Exactly. And it's actually a, a mirror of the layer opacity slider. So as I slide this left and right in the upper right hand corner, you can actually see, um, the, the layer zero opacity changing as well. Ah, yeah, I see that. Cool. You know, that, uh, that, that, that always struck me as, as one of the, the reasons why uh, one might choose to use a plugin such as this is the, um, e even if you know how to do, you know, create really cool black and white conversions in, in Lightroom or, or Photoshop or whatever software you're using, the, um, the offering of all the presets uh, can really kind of jumpstart the creative process because it pr process because it provides you with you know many different types of aesthetic starting points that you might choose to then either use as is or uh, use as a starting point and then modify further and you know obviously Lightroom you can save presets and, and it does come with with uh, some presets but you don't necessarily have um, the thumbnails there to kind of quickly kind of get a sense of what the preset might look like. Although, of course, you, you could simply mouse over a develop preset and then you get a little preview up in the navigator panel in Lightroom. Right, right. But, you know, it's, it's for creative purposes. These are, these are all fantastic. Like whether you're within Lightroom or uh, here within Tonality or, you know, the Nick plugins or whatever, um, all of these, all of these, all of its tools are basically designed to offer more control or different kinds of creative control to, uh, to the photographer, right? And so, you know, utilizing presets in any way is going to be beneficial, um, whether or not you're just clicking on a preset and just clicking the apply button, or you're going in and doing all this customized kind of work, um, you know, utilizing layers and layer masks and so on. Right, right. So um if we if we take a gander at the original image I, I think that the the underexposed preset that we've clicked on does a pretty good job to address some of the issues that i have with the photograph but uh before we just really jump in and do these things um it, specifically on this photo i get lost in in the top right there, there's almost no tones in the top half of the image um and so my eye sort of gets drawn up there and then I pay no attention to really anything else. So I think it's going to be really important in, in the adjustments that we make here to sort of draw the viewer's attention down and probably back around into, you know, the pier and into these really wonderful rocks and then the kind of mists of that long exposure. Uh, the, the underexposed preset, it does a pretty good job of that right off the bat. And, and it actually helps me to kind of understand the direction that I want to go in, uh, but it's not perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and just dial down the underexposed um, preset to about 80 or 85, because in this case, that's what I like. It's what, what, what looks best for me, uh, or at least it, I think so. Of course, all these things are totally subjective, right, Sean? So, um, you know, folks might not love every single adjustment. But anyways, um, we've clicked on that underexposed. I'm going to go ahead and add another layer. So again, back into the upper right corner, click that plus button. Um, and if I go and I use another preset like underexposed again, it kind of adds on top of layer zero. 
right? And actually it's, it's adjusted at that 85 um, opacity as well. So this could be cool because I do want to uh, darken the sky a little bit more. And this is a very easy way to do this. Uh, but in, in my case, I'm gonna do this kind of manually. So I'm gonna go ahead and reset this layer. So click that reset button. I'm gonna hide the presets. This is going to give us a little bit more real estate for our photos so we can get a, a better idea of what's happening. Um, and I, I want to use what's called a luminosity mask here, but I guess before we do that, um, let's, let's kind of darken down uh, the, the image. And I, again, we're only going to really keep the top portion of the image applied with this particular layer. Um, but I want to go and darken it down. And Sean, I tend to actually over adjust the image uh, when I'm when I'm doing these sorts of things, and then I pull back the opacity of the layer. So you know yeah. I might I might overdo it on clarity here, it just visually, and say oh that's that's too much. Um, but I think what happens when I pull back that opacity is it sort of evens it back out. Yeah. Well, you know what I like to tell people about making adjustments adjustments like that, or, or really any kind of adjustment, is that it's okay to go too far because you never know what's too far until you've gone too far and then you can easily back it off until you find that sweet spot. Right. I love that. That's a good way of saying it. Actually. I've never, never heard it put exactly that way. And I like it. I'm going to use that. <laughs> in, in photography and in life, you never know when you've gone too far until you've gone too far. <laughs> my word, of, my word of wisdom for the day. <laughs> so uh, I went and I clicked on, I clicked on the brush tool first off to tell you how I got into this mode. Um, and then I clicked on luminosity mask, and this is actually a, a newish feature. I think this came out in June in the in the most recent update of Tonality Pro. Um, it, it does take a second for the software to kind of crunch through the information, uh, but when I click that luminosity mask, what's going to happen is the the software. You can see it in a, a very this very small thumbnail here. You can just see the uh, the mask itself. It, it tries to figure out what the highlights are and select the highlights automatically in some of the brighter tones. So if, if we could actually blow this up some way, this thumbnail, uh, you'd notice that the whole lower right corner isn't going to be affected by our adjustments here. Um, and in fact, I'm going to go ahead and bring my standard adjustment. Oops, now I'm losing my contrast um, as I sort of take it a little bit too far. And what we're going to finish this off with is a gradient. So the gradient function is going to help us to kind of uh, just apply the effect to the sky and really only to the very brightest values um, until we get into those. Well, I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong. Uh, it's going to affect all of the sky because of this um, gradient tool, and then it'll affect only a little bit into uh, the water or anything that's below the gradient feature itself. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, click the apply button. And let's just turn that layer on and off. Yeah, and then let me ask you a quick clarification here. I, I noticed that as you're working on that, the the thumbnail there for that layer, which which kind of I think was showing the luminosity mask before. Now that you have applied the the gradient to lighten the sky, of course, in the little thumbnail, the sky has gotten white there, and there's a little bit of gradient transition. Is that kind of a, uh, for want of a better word, you know? permanent change to that mask or is the gradient kind of a flexible thing that can be adjusted at any time and kind of recover some of the original luminosity mask? A great question. So I believe I can do an undo, but uh -huh. other than that, you, you can't really go back. It's, it's sort of been right. adjusted. Now, you know, hypothetically, if I said, okay, well, I really don't like that gradient, which I did click the apply button, you know, it does, you still have to click the apply to it to uh, have it effect. Um, yeah. Uh, you can I could start over by clicking luminosity mask again, and then, but that's, and that's just make a new luminosity it, mask. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Which isn't a good workaround. It's not, that's not the, the ideal answer, <laughs> right? Uh, ideally you yeah. could just back and use that original luminosity mask. Okay. So we've affected the top portion of the image. I want to now kind of draw your attention into the rocks and we're going to do this part really quickly. There's just two more layers that I want to add. Uh, one that kind of gives us a little softer feel of the water and then one uh, that's going to give us some, some nice texture and tone in the rocks. So for this, we're just going to add another layer. And, and this, this is, I, I say that this kind of workflow, what we're doing right now harks back to um, a, a Photoshop workflow where you're using uh, you know, adjustment layers and you're brushing them into specific portions of the photograph. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll add that extra layer. I'm going to move into the clarity and the structure tool. I'm just going to go ahead and bump up the clarity 
and bump up the structure. This is going to give us a lot of texture on the entire image, uh, but we're only going to basically apply it to the, the rocks uh, here on the right side of the photograph. So while um, we are adjusting the entire image when we make these sort of global effects, uh, I'll then go in with my brush tool and basically just brush it into the rocks so that we're bringing that attention, you know, the detail, the texture, um, in the viewer's eye, hopefully, by adding in this extra contrast uh, into the rocks here. And, you know, again, I think I've, I've kind of overdone it. If you were to compare these rocks to the rest of the image, I think there's too much contrast. It's a little too dark um, and a little too much texture. But uh, the love of these filters, we're just going to go ahead and sort of dial that down to make this effect much more subtle. Uh, one of the things that I tell my students almost every single day once we've got into post-processing is that you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, <laughs> Right. It's easy to kind of overdo it on these things. I still think I've got too much texture on those rocks there. Um, and, and it's important to do that. It's important to see what overdoing it is. But, you know, you dial it back a little bit here and there. Um, if, it, if it doesn't, if it feels like it's too much, it's probably too much. All right. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of soften up the water just a touch. Uh, so I've just added another layer. We're on layer number three. I'm going to go into the glow filter. I'm going to add just this nice softened glow and adjust the smooth rating and the, uh, the threshold just a touch. And what we're getting here is this, this sort of smoothing of that water. So most of the image, it's actually affecting the entire photo right now, but um, you know, most of the image now has this kind of harsh overall feel to it with the, uh, the, right. the texture that we've added. Uh, by, by adding in this glow, we're just kind of softening it up, you know, kind of bringing it back just a touch. And I'm just going to brush the effect. Let me, let, me, let me ask you a, qu a quick question just to clarify for myself. And obviously, if I need to clarify for myself, then somebody else might need that too. Sure. So, you know, when you first applied that glow effect, it, it affects the whole image. And then you go get your masking tools. And so I noticed that when you started painting, it looked like the mask went black. And then, of course, it, it becomes white where you're painting. Is there some sort of a keyboard shortcut you're using to invert the mask and hide the effect? Or does it automatically do that once you start using the brush? No, it automatically does that. That's a fantastic question. I can't believe I missed it. Thank you for, for actually bringing that up. Um, so the, the adjustments when you add a new layer, it's going to affect it's going to affect the entire photograph as it was, you know, you'd expect, basically. Um, right. But, but if you, if you tell the software that you're going to use the brush tool, so if you click on the brush tool, it will automatically, um, basically, like you said, invert the mask and make it so that we can brush it in selectively. It's, it's kind of just to save, you know, the, the user that extra click or, to, yeah. 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 So no, that, that, that's really cool programming because basically it, it's assuming that when you select the brush, you want to paint in an adjustment in a specific place and it's it's making that kind of leap that assumptive leap for you and then just inverting the mask so that when you paint it only shows up your paint that, that's pretty slick right it, yeah right it makes that assumption for you it just says oh well you've clicked on the brush tool you probably just want this adjustment in a particular portion of the photo nice nice so well you know just taking a quick look at the before and after the original image by the way i've clicked on the sort of split preview or dual preview the compare um in the upper portion of the interface there and we're, on the left we have the original and on the right we have the enhanced image or adjusted photograph um and i i would say the one on the the right is leaps and bounds better um for, for telling the story that i'm interested in, in telling and, and directing your eye as the yeah. as the viewer yeah, definitely. I would, I, I would concur with that statement. <laughs> do you concur, doctor? <laughs> yes, you concur, doctor. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Uh, so as far as, as working with layers and, and layer masks and so on, we, we have tons of capability here within Tonality Pro. Um, here, I'm going to go click on the layer properties portion. It's in the lower right corner of the interface. Uh, it, this option... The, the only reason I really didn't talk about it before is because these are the same options that you have if you just right click on a particular layer. Uh, I find that right clicking on that layer is a little bit faster and a little bit easier. Uh, but if you forget to do that, everything we've talked about in terms of adjusting opacity, you have a whole bunch of different blending modes, which we 
didn't even talk about. Um, and then our, our source. So you've got previous layer, which is the default, and then our awesome original image, um, you know, kind of, of, of workflow where it, it allows you to utilize those original color pixels. Uh, that's all accessible there within layer properties on the bottom portion of the right side of the interface. Um, one thing to note, so the camera that I was shooting, it has a super, super dirty sensor. And in the original image, you really don't see it. Uh, but once this renders, you'll, you'll notice a whole bunch of, of dirt specks that are starting to show up. So I assume these are all, um, you know, sensor spots, some goop or something got on the sensor at some point, uh, and it's either still there or it's the residual stuff. And um, we will have to clean that up in post. So we'll click the apply button. And then in Photoshop, I would probably use a clone and a heel stamp uh, to kind of clean up all of those little issues. Um, but if you, if you look at the transition, it kind of makes sense as to why we're starting to see that. We're, we're taking all sure. these very bright values, darkening them down, and then adding a ton of contrast. So yeah. I'm gonna show up. So, um, so just a, a point of clarification for people. Um, when you are in here and you do click apply, uh, it, it's going to take you back into Photoshop and apply all the changes that you've made here to the layer that was active when you launched the plugin. That's correct? Correct. Yep. And as soon as this is finished processing, we'll, we'll kind of see that happen as well. But um, once it's applied to that layer, it's not like it is... Um, is it flexible? Is there a way to get back to the this same set of layers you've worked at and layer masks? Like if you made the layer a smart object before you came into Tonality Pro, would that give you kind of a, a way to get back to the settings you had just applied in Tonality Pro? That, that's a great question. We should try that. So in, in the previous version of the software, it did do that, but it was shaky. Um, I haven't yeah. tried that from, from Photoshop because I tend to use this from Lightroom, but I say we give that a try there. Um, yeah, let's, let, let's live on the edge. <laughs> So uh, I'm just going to turn the background layer into a, a smart object then. I turned off the tonality layer, um, and we'll give it a go. Yeah, just, just apply a quick preset or something, and, and maybe maybe one layer or something, just so we can get an idea of what's going on. Sounds good. And uh, my, my system here is starting to slow down, as it seems. And there we go. Finally converted that thing. Uh, and you know, uh, for those people watching and listening, you know, apropos that this little quick question that is leading to a, a an on the fly experiment we're doing here, I always you know advise people you know if you have a, a question about gee, I wonder if if this would work or whatever, you know, give it a try. If if you do it on a copy layer, uh, you're not going to hurt the image, so give it a try. You know, you you might learn something in the process. All right, so we've got our uh, layer zero, which has a, a preset on it, and then layer one, uh, where I just sort of adjusted the, the tonal you know, values of the top portion of the image and brushed it in. Uh, we'll go back over to Photoshop and see what happens. So in the initial version of Tonality Pro, it, it came out, and for lots of folks, the smart object capability worked without any problem. But for some systems, for some reason, um, it didn't work very well. So we'll see this one. Let's see. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on Tonality Pro again. That should relaunch the software. And so just to clarify for, for listeners, we, what we have now is we have a layer, a smart object layer that has a smart filter, and the smart filter is identified as Tonality Pro. And Dan just double clicked on the line Tonality Pro to relaunch the filter. And what do we see, Dan? It, it did work. So the, the, it is smart object capable. The, the thing that's weird, though, Sean, is that uh, the layer one was off when we came into the software here. So it, the hmm. eye, yeah. So you know, that was a little bit weird because I would have expected that to be on. But uh, it does work, and all of your layers are there. So there's that. Right, right. And, and then so uh, for people interested in pursuing such a workflow in Lightroom, um. Let's see, there's a way in Lightroom that you can open uh, a raw file as a smart object, but I'm not sure how that would work with, with actually a plugin. I can't envision uh, the, the, the hook in for that. Right. 
Um, and there's no, so I, I don't think that that would work from Lightroom. I think you have to open it over into Photoshop as a, as a smart object, unless there's yeah, some sort yeah. of script that you can write to tell it to kind of automatically do that. And then, you know, it, I don't imagine it does it on its own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. But there, there is a way to do that. And that way you, you could keep your, um, your tonality edits, uh, kind of in a flexible state so that you could go back and tweak them after the fact um after hitting the apply button right cool well that was that was a great demo i i i learned some stuff that uh, i didn't know and i kind of was reacquainted with stuff that i knew when i first um was introduced to, to tonality pro but then had kind of forgotten about so thanks oh no problem yeah, thank you that it's i love talking about this stuff whether it's a particular piece of software or just you know shooting the the conversation um with it with other people who are interested right 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 yeah no great well that was really cool dan um you know um it, it reminded me of some of the things that i really like about how mac fun tonality pro is is designed and, and laid out and, and actually as i just said that name uh it also reminded me to clarify for people that um at the present time anyway mac fun is a mac only piece of software is that correct that's a good point yes it absolutely is yeah i know that they were hoping to um port their uh, their new hdr program aurora hdr pro over to to windows at some point but i don't know if that is is something they're also working on for the rest of their their software suite yeah i don't i don't know the answer to that one but i should hope that they do uh, because it does, it would open up an entirely new set of people that could play with the software and, and create some cool stuff. And Aurora is awesome. There's some incredible yeah. tools in it. Well, and the other thing too that that is kind of a, a reality now is that since um, since Google has decided to make the Nick collection free, that kind of basically is a harbinger that that software has has kind of reached the end of its development life and Google is not going to be putting any more resources into keeping it current. So, so for those people who, who like to use the Nick collection and the Nick silver effects pro, uh, you know, obviously that's going to be good for a while, as long as it'll run on their operating system. But uh, at a certain point in time, uh, you know, operating systems are going to evolve beyond it and it, it may not work anymore. So uh, I think Mac fun tonality pro for people who like, uh, you know, really good black and white plugin is, is definitely an option to look into. Yeah. Well, sad, but true. I, you know, I, I, I don't know one way or another, but that's, that's definitely how it looks in terms of the, the Nick plugins going that way. That one piece of advice for yeah, folks. Yeah. Who, well, that's, that's kind of the, the conventional wisdom that I hear, you know, is that, you know, once they decide to give it away, it's like, huh, I would be surprised if they, they came out with a whole new version, but who knows they might, you know, right, truth is right. stranger than fiction. Absolutely. But if you, if you do so, like the Nick... Yeah, so, so Dan... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish okay. that thought. About Just, you, if you, if it's a, in, you know, an important thing for your workflow to utilize, let's say, SilverFX Pro, uh, don't update your operating system immediately, and then you can find out from other people if their, their tools don't work. And worst comes to worst, you just keep a system that you never update, right? Which is terrible, but people in the photo... Right sort of do that from time to time yeah yeah you could keep a totally separate boot drive that has a different os on it and and use your plugins that way right so so dan you just got finished uh teaching uh a photography class at at uh, rit um and you know we've been talking about black and white here and i'm just wondering if you have any you know kind of words words of advice for people who are interested in in getting started uh, shooting and processing black white images, or maybe if they already are um, started uh, with that exploration, so if you have any words of advice for um, helping them kind of see better in black and white and, and see maybe uh, the potential uh, in some of the scenes that they're photographing. Yeah, uh, two quick answers on that one, Sean. Um, one is shoot raw plus JPEG. And you can actually utilize the in-camera black and white styles, which are very limited, but at least will show you on the back of your camera a black and white representation of your image. So that can be good when you're out in the field shooting. And then you also have the raw data that you'd utilize for the actual conversion. Um, and then the other thing is, because there's no color 
although you do utilize the color information and it can be uh, advantageous to, you know, utilize color when capturing, you know, note that you are going for a black and white image. And so you have to focus on sort of the line, tonal difference, gesture, um, you know, the shape, form, those sorts of things, more so than the color itself. You know, color is still important, though. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, right, right. When I was, uh, when I was first traveling in Europe uh, back in the mid-1980s, I actually carried two camera bodies with me. One was loaded with black and white film and one was loaded with color film because, of course, you know, back in the film days, we didn't have the luxury of just shooting in color and making our decision after the fact, so I had to, like, shoot two bodies. But there were definitely <laughs> some scenes that I saw that kind of spoke to me as a black and white scene and some spoke to me as a color scene. Right. Absolutely. And cool. And, you know, the, well, the thanks, so, reality. thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. The, the, the alternate reality. And, and, and you're right. Black and white is, is an abstraction. And it, it's interesting to, to see the world through that different view. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the joys of photography is that it does allow us the ability to, to see the world and interpret the world in, in different ways. So, so uh, Dan, thanks so much for stopping by and uh, giving us that, that tour into some of the maybe overlooked aspects of Mac Fontanelli Pro and the use of layers and how that can be used to, to craft a cool image. Very instructional. I'm sure that people enjoyed seeing that, and I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, my pleasure, Sean. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that and found that useful and illuminating. Uh, I know I certainly picked up uh, some new things that I did not know about MechFun Tonality Pro. Uh, it's a really cool piece of software, so you should definitely check it out uh, if you have not already done so. Uh, they do have a trial version that you can take for a test drive uh, that you can download from their website. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And uh, right now I want to go over what you need to do to enter to win the Rocky Nook book of your choice as part of this week's book giveaway. It's pretty simple. All you need to do is come to our website, thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix, and find the episode page for this show. That's episode 78. And leave a comment down at the bottom of the page. Uh, and either post a black and white image that you've processed and uh, you know, give us a, a couple lines, tell us what you did to it. Or you can also uh, post a, a suggestion for a future topic or a guest that you might like to see interviewed or profiled on a future episode of the show. So uh, in terms of leaving the comment, we do have kind of a discussion moderation uh, software or uh, service that helps us manage that. And just make sure that when you sign up for that, that uh, you do uh, have an email address associated with your profile so that when uh, I reply to your comment, you'll hear about it. Uh, failing that, uh, check back at the uh, end of the giveaway period to see if you have won. And apropos the giveaway period, the giveaway period is two weeks. So let me go to my calendar here and figure out what two weeks is going to be. Um, two weeks is going to be August 23rd, Tuesday, August 23rd, end of day. So at the end of day, Tuesday, August 23rd, entries for this book giveaway will close and we'll pick a winner. And again, end of day is uh, Pacific Standard Time, uh, you know, right before midnight, end of day on Tuesday. So that's the news for uh, what you need to do to enter the Rocky Nook book giveaway. Thanks very much for watching. You can subscribe to the show by going to the website thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix. There's a subscription box on the right side and there is a contact us link at the top if you want to get in touch and tell us what you like to see on future episodes. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks for watching The Fix. We will catch you next week here in this same bat station.